we are now moving to the next uh, session, our first um, uh, panel discussion. And so for this, we have um, uh, three speakers um, who are experts in uh, waste management, uh, recycling, uh, these areas uh, from different uh, countries. And so we have Ashish Chaturvedi, who's um, director of climate change at GIZ India, um, who specializes on the link between climate, waste management, and also sustainable consumption and production, um, particularly facilitating uh, the German-Indian cooperation on, on these issues. And then we also have um, Malek Sukar, who's the chief executive officer of Averda, um, a leading provider of waste management services in emerging markets. Um, with offices uh, in or in operations uh, over 10 countries across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, and then we have Joanne Green, who's uh, leading the policy work on plastics and waste at Tier Fund. Um, and Joanne has um, significant experience in influencing governments, uh, global institutions on poverty and environment. Um, for the last 20 years, also previously working on SDGs and um, uh, previously also taking roles at uh, head of policy at CAFOD. And the way we um, structure this panel is that each of the speakers will have 10 minutes um, to present um, the work they're doing on, on waste uh, policies, um, and then we invite you as well to uh, post questions again in the Q&A box. And then we have, um, uh, again, a Q&A session afterwards. So we have about one hour for this uh, session. And I would like to invite Ashish Chaturvedi now um, to start um, to un um, unmute yourself and then um, share your screen or your camera uh, for your PowerPoint, if you have one. Um, okay, Ashish, the floor is yours. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, and thanks very much. I don't have a PowerPoint. I'll just uh, sort of talk uh, about sort of what uh, we're trying to do in India and what uh, lessons we've drawn from the work that we're doing in India. Uh, in terms of uh, the kind of activities which are happening, and I'm going to talk very specifically from the vantage point of uh, sort of our experiences in India, all the GIZ works all around the world uh, in sort of, sort of developing and emerging economies. So in terms of the kind of work that we're doing, uh, there's a significant amount of work that is happening in the area of developing strategies for resource efficiency and circular economy. So for instance, the European Union and uh, sort of supported by GIZ developed the resource efficiency strategy for the government of India in partnership with the Niti Aayog, which is uh, the planning commission, with the erstwhile planning commission, uh, which also serves now as the think tank for the government of India. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of initiatives which are happening in the area of waste management. Uh, so the government of India has a large program, one of the largest programs in the world called the Clean India Program, called Swachh Bharat in, in Hindi. And it's one of the biggest investment programs for transitioning into better waste management practices and approaches in urban areas as well as rural areas. And of course, there are initiatives which are being taken by the private sector as well uh, in order to sort of implement uh, certain approaches and certain uh, uh, sort of uh, initiatives in the waste management space. Uh, for instance, a lot of the waste management legislations now use extended producer responsibility as the driver for uh, investments in the waste management sector by the private sector. Uh, now, given all of these experiences, I'd like to focus on a few messages uh, or the learnings that we've actually encountered and developed uh, over the last few years working on waste management in India. One of the first things is, and I think given the title of the panel as well on inclusive policy approaches, I think there is a significant amount of uh, focus on waste as an environmental issue 
And this has been the traditional development of policy approaches in the Indian case as well, Indian uh, sort of example, where waste was traditionally looked at as an environmental sort of burden and environmental challenge. Uh, of course, this is the focus of all the legislation, uh, the, the way the environment ministry takes the lead on uh, waste uh, regulations. There's a very significant focus on environmental issues. However, uh, as is very evident from the sort of debates in circular economy and the discussions on circular economy, waste is definitely not only an environmental issue. Uh, waste has significant dimensions uh, in the Indian context on social policies, on jobs. Uh, almost, uh, well, one and a half to two percent of the urban population in India, estimated by the World Bank, is engaged in waste management. And that's a massive number of people who are actually involved in the waste value chains sort of in the urban areas. Uh, there is, of course, a significant dimension of uh, waste as a raw material and therefore underpinning the industrial policy. And there are green shoots or sort of, uh, sort of initiatives in that direction where the steel ministry in India is now talking about how to look at recycling of cars as a sort of a the provider of raw material for the steel sector. So there is the dimension of industrial policy, there's a dimension of social policy, and of course, we've briefly touched upon this entire idea of resource security and trade policy as well. Now, given this complex uh, sort of uh, policy agenda, where inclusion of these uh, sort of circular economy concerns has to now enter all of these different policies at the industrial policy level, environment policy level, uh, I think it's very critical to unpack uh, the way in which these policy approaches are actually being translated on the ground. Uh, on sort of on the ground in terms of at the level of a city or even with working with the private sector. So when you actually start thinking about all of these different kinds of policies, which have a potential implication on how to implement circular economy approaches, then one needs to start thinking about who are the critical actors uh, involved in the implementation of these policies and development of these policy approaches. So just to give you a very sort of simple example, uh, well, it sounds simple, but it's way more complicated in implementation. The idea of actually having a resource efficiency strategy for India and then translating it into the context of cities as well as sort of the federal states. So, of course, the, there is a parallel in some sense to the European Union's example of developing a circular economy package at the national level and then translating it at the sort of well member state level. However, the kind of uh, sort of well, autonomy that federal states in India have is much lesser than, for instance, the autonomy that a federal or a member state in the European Union might have when it comes to policy formulation. So when a resource efficiency initiative or a resource efficiency strategy is announced at the national level by the government of India, then it actually has to be implemented by the state governments and by the city governments. Now, what kind of capacities are required to translate these policy objectives into implemented action, implementable actions on the ground is very much dependent on what kind of capacities are there to process all of this additional knowledge or to bring these different kinds of actors of who are implementing industrial policy, environment policy, digital solutions, resource security policies, trade policies at the subnational level as well. And this is where I think we hit a lot of roadblocks when it comes to implementation of an inclusive policy agenda. Uh, and therefore, I think what needs to work, uh, what needs to happen is to actually look at how we strengthen capacities at different line ministry level at the national level. And if you actually have a whole of government approach at the national level, how do you translate that to the different levels of government so that it can, there is a certain amount of fidelity into the process of implementation of a circular economy agenda. I have spoken about this uh, sort of in previous uh, sort of uh, in other forums as well. What happens on the ground in terms of implementation, for instance, on electronic waste management? Uh, of course, the laws are actually very well defined. Um, uh, there are certain targets which are uh, sort of uh, defined as well. But when it comes to the implementation on the ground, there are a lot of significant capacity gaps which lead to the gaps in implementation. And uh, therefore, I think it's very critical to look at sort of unpacking what kind of support is offered? I think uh, Marius actually talked about the support 
which can be offered at uh, by the European Union at the national uh, level and at, in emerging economies as part of aid packages. I think one part is to support national governments, but then also support the implementation of these activities at the subnational level so that these models can actually be showcased and implemented on the ground as well. Now, that's, that's more at the policy level where I'm basically trying to suggest that you need to bring different actors together in a whole of government approach as far as circular economy is concerned. You also need to look at how are these coordination issues across different ministries resolved and how are these issues also resolved at different levels of government. Now, the other sort of large point that I would like to make, and then I will, of course, uh, sort of, uh, I think I would run out of time in any case by that time, is to talk about uh, the role of informal sector and the, uh, the role of the marginalized communities uh, in this entire drive towards a circular economy. So is the circular economy, I think there was a question which uh, Tim had raised or paraphrased in the previous session, which was about how do you look at uh, sort of countries which might end up losing from the transition to a circular economy? How do you get them on board? Now, similarly, there are groups within a country which might end up losing from a transition to a circular economy, and there are others who would benefit from this transition to a circular economy. Uh, of course, there are certain voices which will be amplified, and this is something that I've written about in the past, certain voices or certain alliances which will be amplified because they are politically much better connected, they have more financial support, or they're more aligned to global discussions on circular economy. For instance, the large private companies uh, which are working at different or multinational companies uh, might actually benefit from this entire transition to a circular economy because they have better knowledge, because they have access to financial resources, because they're going to set the debate better than others. However, we also have to think about the local communities or the local informal sector who might potentially lose access to waste because there is a transition to a circular economy. And I think this is where a lot of literature has emerged where they, we need to actually have a certain human face to the circular economy or social angle, social dimension of the circular economy has to be strengthened. I think there's a lot of discussion on technology. There's a lot of discussion on finance. There's a lot of discussion on cutting edge sort of solutions and security, but it's very focused on the people, on communities or on sort of those stakeholders who already have a very strong voice. Whereas the communities which actually might end up losing from this transition to a circular economy, and it doesn't necessarily, I'm not suggesting that it, it is necessarily going to happen that they will lose from the transition to a circular economy. But this might be a fear, there might be a fear and those voices are actually not being amplified and not being supported in a significant way in the kind of literature and in the kind of advocacy efforts that we see. Uh, and therefore, I think we have to be very mindful that this circular economy agenda is not seen as an agenda which is driven by certain interest groups, certain sort of groups of countries, but a more inclusive agenda in that global inclusive sense of leaving no one behind. And I think that's very critical for the discussion on uh, mainstreaming circular economy approaches uh, for the poorest of the poor as well as the marginalized. So I would stop here at this stage and happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Ashish, for your reflections and um, your experience from your work in India. Um, we do the questions uh, afterwards all together. Um, we, go, uh, we go straight to um, the next presentation. Um, so I'd like to give um, the microphone or the floor um, to Malik uh, Sukhar now. Um, good morning and thank you, Patrick. And thank you, Ashish, for a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, we operate about uh, 15,000 people on a daily basis, uh, ranging from uh, picking up a uh, collection of waste all the way through to uh, recovery of energy, going through a recycling and uh, valorization of the waste in various forms. Now, the clients that we, that we sort of service can be broken down into three very distinct groups. One, which is the municipal, which is a scale business and, and requires a different kind of solution. And the other is the corporate, where we have a lot of uh, you know, manufacturing or a lot of uh, multinationals who have a very specific requirement. And then the third is the individual householder or a small business that requires a very basic but reliable service. And what we've seen is there's a different uh, trajectory of the circular economy coming through. 
And we operate in countries where the desire may well be there. The investment hasn't really come through to push through these, these, these uh, desired outcomes. And if we look at sanitation on the whole, it is one of the infrastructures that get spent on the last, you know, if someone's building roads or building energy or building, what we find is sanitation is unfortunately a footnote in these investment uh, criteria and, and spend. And so we come to the, to the kitty when it's empty, when we come and say, we need to be doing this or we need to be doing that. And so from that perspective, the basics of the circular economy, I'm speaking as an operator, I'm not a policy person, is not difficult conceptually, right? At the end, you know, we need to collect the waste in an organized and, you know, reliable manner that, you know, identifies the types of waste that are being, you know, collected and what to do with it. And that's primarily not a, a, a challenge, neither technologically nor operationally. The second is establishing and building the facilities that would need to be dealing with these uh, volumes as they come in. And again, that's, there's a lot of proven technologies, whether it's in, in, in the recycling or in the uh, treatment of, of food waste or, or recovering energy from various streams. The third is to ensure that we have a, a, a framework around which people have to operate and make sure that you don't have leakage of these volumes. I think the informal sector, as Ashish mentioned, is a very powerful actor. And you can know almost you know, what is you know, profitable or popular as a material by the waste volumes that we don't see in our materials recovery facilities. You know, we don't see aluminum in most countries. We don't see steel, we don't see copper. These are materials that get leached out of the, the, uh, uh, the streets almost at that level. And so what we deal with is a scale problem. There's a lot of people who point out to these being a you know, small successes in a small village or in a small sector. But the reality is when we deal with thousands of tons on a daily basis, it, it requires a governmental and private sector solution that is effective and, and sustainable. And I think this is where we find the challenge in going forward. The emerging world is probably 10 to 20 years behind some of the leading OECD countries in terms of the circularity. And, and whilst that could be you know, speeded up and, and caught up, the reality is this is a journey. You, know, you have to first collect the waste in an organized manner, then you have to have a, a decent facility, then you have to start looking at the behaviors because that's the one that takes the longest. You know, the, the, the fact of separating your waste into three or four different bins or as a company making sure that you do not you know, put hazardous waste or different kinds of waste. And we're finding that already the challenge in the COVID waste where we're collecting for some of our corporate clients we've had to send in our people five and 10 times to explain to people to double bag and to make sure that, you know, the deep cleaning doesn't get wasted because they haven't done uh, the right procedure. So from that perspective, that journey is probably five to 10 years. And if you really speed up, it's five to 10 years. There is really very little time that can be saved by not doing. The problem with governments, generally speaking, in, in, where, you know, in the emerging world is they, they tend to wait and hope they can sort of leapfrog this thing. And, and there really is no uh, leapfrogging to that. And so what we're asking here for is a very simple framework where we can start encouraging people to, to invest in recycling facilities. We don't believe that you know, shipping plastic out or shipping the materials out of a given country is the right answer. Fundamentally, that actually continues the, the sort of the cycle of the informality. I think what should happen is there should be a, a, a push towards the industrialization of these processes and to make sure that we have a really good control over them. And I do agree with Ashish, there may be some losers, but at the end of the day, you can always offset that by having a proper and organized, you know, sort of transition uh, period over which you can do that. The other thing that gets really under in, invested in is the amount of awareness and education that needs to be done both at the sort of the, you know, the children and, and educational level, but also at the corporate. I mean, what we find is the international corporations that we serve tend to get their orders from Europe or North America, and they have a very distinct and prescriptive manner in which they have to deal with their waste. And we, they require very little education or very little awareness on, on you know, the waste types that they are creating. Alternatively, a lot of the smaller and, and more localized producers 
do not have really a clue. And I think we need to have, you know, I think uh, Pace is working, you know, and on, and I think David is speaking a little bit later on a sort of a, a passport for materials. And I think that has to be something that we work, you know, into translating into many languages and making sure that people understand what it is in their hands because every day there's a new material that gets created whether it's from nanotechnology or electronics and these waste volumes everybody thinks that if you put it in the right electronics bin you know for every time someone puts something in the right electronics bin we as an industry have to invest in the uh, <laughs> the machine that you know takes it apart the machine that recognizes what this material is made from and where to send it so the the fact of just putting it in the right bin doesn't solve it it's the beginning of the the journey but it's not the solution and so what we're looking for is really a twofold uh, approach right there is one of investment where governments and the private sector can come in and and really quickly put down the investment necessary and i think there's plenty of capital i think the esg uh, revolution that has been happening over the last few years from the stock market and and from you know sort of the OECD countries has caused a major shift in the way we look at sort of sustainability and the environment. So the investment, the capital could possibly, you know, follow a very simple, you know, policy. The enforcement is usually where it falls down in the emerging world. You know, a lot of people get, uh, you know, given a latitude in, in not delivering their, their work properly. And I think there is the enforcement aspect is very, very important. And we have to make sure that we do that quite professionally. So in summary, I think investment without enforcement is wasted and enforcement without investment is tyranny. And I think we need to make sure that we balance the two very quickly to be able to drive the circularity from you know below 9% or 8% in, in the emerging world to where it should be nearer to 70 and 80%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malik. And again, uh, yes, please post your questions through the Q&A and um, then we have one more presentation now, and then we go to the questions. So um, I'd like to ask Joanne, um, floor is yours, please unmute and then um, you have 10 minutes. So for those of you who don't know, Tier Fund is a Christian relief and development charity. We're based in the UK and we work in 50 countries around the world and um, we work on poverty and environmental issues uh, at a local level. We work with the local church and church based organisations, um, but we also work on global issues as well, which is where my work sits. And um, obviously we've become increasingly concerned about the amounts of waste that's being generated in poorer countries and the impact that that's having directly on poor people's health and their environment. Um, last year, we released a report called No Time to Waste, which um, was really the sort of first report, I think, looking in depth at the impact of waste and plastics on the health of people in poverty. And in that, we estimated that up to a million people die um, each year because of diseases associated with mismanaged waste and plastics. Um, now I'm gonna focus um, down on plastics in particular in, in what I'm going to say. And I suppose the first thing to say is that we believe all stakeholders do have a responsibility to address this, this issue. Um, but we believe that fast moving consumer goods companies um, have a leading role to play because they have um, a moral responsibility to, to reduce their waste and to collect their waste. It is their waste, their plastic waste. And they also have the capacity and the resources to do that, we believe. Um, so whilst we're all in favour of mandatory approaches, we know that in a lot of countries, especially the poorest countries, governments don't yet have the capacity to um, implement those. So we believe it is up to companies to, to lead. Um, and also, we know that the first step in the waste hierarchy is to reduce. So I'm going to focus, although we have lots of recommendations on other things as well, I'm going to focus on reduction in particular. And this is the subject of a report that we actually just released yesterday called The Burning Question. Uh, will companies reduce their plastic use? Which um, is following on from our No Time to Waste report last year. And we are continuing to look at 
health, but also at the impact, particularly of open burning on climate change. And um, this um, is something that we believe uh, poor people are concerned about. They're concerned about um, plastic that is being openly burned and other waste that is being openly burned near them. This is Royder, who lives um, near a, a huge rubbish dump in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania with her three children. And um, she is um, concerned about the breathing difficulties that her and her children are experiencing because of um, the rubbish that's being burned almost continually there. And we know that plastic, in particular, and the burning of plastic um, produces particulate matter, which also um, you know, affects people's upper respiratory um, tract, um, causes cancer and other problems. And people like this are having to spend money going to hospital because of breathing difficulties that they're having. So um, we're really trying to, to highlight um, as well as the climate impacts as well, saying that this is something that's affecting people in poverty. It's not just an environmental issue, it is affecting people now and companies have a moral responsibility to do something about it. Now, one of the things that some of the statistics, these are some of the statistics that we found. So this is the first time that um, we've attempted to do estimates of a particular companies' plastic pollution footprint in six countries around the world. So we looked at India, Brazil, Mexico, Philippines, China, India, and Nigeria. Um, we've been asking the companies to publish how much plastic they sell in these countries for a year now, and they haven't done that yet. So we attempted to do that for them. And then based on that, we, um, using World Bank figures, we were able to estimate um, how much of that plastic was burnt or dumped in those six countries. And what we found is that there, um, there was enough plastic pollution created by those four companies in just those six countries to cover 83 football pitches every day. So it's half a million tonnes. And that's more than one football pitch every 20 minutes. And then what we were able to do using that and new academic analysis published by Imperial College and a new paper that's been published, which is estimating the contribution of open burning um, to climate change is um, estimate that that plastic pollution creates the same amount of CO2 equivalent as 2 million cars in the UK each year on a road. And again, just emphasizing that's only in six countries. So we know that black carbon, which is the um, greenhouse gas that's produced, is one of the most potent greenhouse gases, thousands of times more potent than CO2. It's a relatively short lived pollutant as well, but it does have an extremely damaging impact on climate change. And then specifically um, on Coca-Cola, we found that, for example, emissions from the open burning of Coca-Cola's plastic are as much as three quarters of their global transport and distribution emissions. And at the moment, we know that um, the, these sort of emissions basically are, are hidden almost. Um, they're not being included in companies' um, sort of calculations of their own contribution to climate change and it's something that we think they should consider much more. Um, the other thing that we found was that um, the worst polluters are doing the least so we um, when we launched our campaign called the rubbish campaign last year we asked um, the four companies that I've just mentioned to reduce their plastic footprint and to collect um, what they continue to sell um, and since then, all of the companies, apart from one, which is Coca-Cola, has made commitments to do that. Um, uh, I would say Unilever have gone the furthest uh, with a commitment to reduce both virgin plastic and overall plastic and also to collect the plastic that they continue to sell. And um, Nestle have also made some significant steps. PepsiCo have, have made a more modest step, but they have at least committed to reduce virgin plastic and Coca-Cola have made no new commitments, um, but yet actually Coca-Cola um, sell, even though they're the smallest of the four companies, um, per dollar of sale, they use much more plastic than any of the others. So even though they're the smallest company, um, their impact on plastic pollution is much higher. So we found that in just six countries, eight billion plastic Coca-Cola bottles are burnt or dumped each year. 
one of the things that when we talk to the companies um, about this issue is that some of them say that people want to continue to consume um, their products in plastic. Um, and I think that is definitely true uh, for some people in um, the global south. However, we wanted to, we, we also knew that there was other data and there's been other surveys out there that show that this isn't the case amongst the majority of the population. And we commissioned our own survey as well in India with Savanta Comres, who's a UK based polling company. And we asked several questions. I think two of the most interesting ones um, were how, if at all, has your attitude to plastic pollution changed over the last few years? So I should say this was with 2,000 adults in India, and this was conducted in December. Um, and 91% of, of people of those surveyed said that they were more concerned about plastic pollution than they were three years ago, with 73% saying they were much more concerned. Um, and secondly, we asked if it led to significantly less plastic pollution in your community and was no more expensive than buying in throwaway containers, would you choose to buy products in refillable or reusable containers rather than throwaway containers? Which is one of our main asks that we want to see companies switch to refillable or reusable containers. And um, as a result of that, 90% said that they, so that's nine out of 10, said that they would be likely, with 68% saying that they would be very likely to switch to that, which we were really surprised by those findings and how um, strong they were. Um, so to summarize, um, we are calling for these companies, firstly, to report by 2020 on the number of units and volumes of single use plastic products they use and sell in each country, to reduce this amount by half um, on a country by country basis by 2025, and switch to alternative delivery methods such as refillable reusable containers. We're asking them thirdly to collect one for one, so for every one that they continue to sell, um, they collect one back. And to also, as they do that, to work with the informal sector and waste pickers to create safe jobs. Um, we know that this is already happening in some places, but believe that this needs to be scaled up. And uh, we believe through this approach, um, companies can take responsibility for the waste that they um, are producing. And we believe that it is vital that if they want to have longevity, um, they need to change, they need to invest, and they need to innovate. Um, and as the world's leading brands and companies, they need to lead. All of these companies claim to be concerned about global health and climate change. Their websites and annual reports make grand commitments about how they contribute to better health and environmental goals. However, at the moment, we see that, I say with the exception of Unilever, the other companies need to go much further. And we know that the response to COVID-19 is rightly taking a lot of time and attention for companies and investors at the moment. However, I think what this crisis shows us is how important it is for businesses to look to long-term environmental sustainability not just short-term gains, and how certain business models can reduce people's resilience to crises like this, and what an important role companies should play in building strong and sustainable communities and societies. Thank you. And I understand your report is also available online, so if people are interested in reading it, they you find this on the Tier Fund uh, website. And if you could, uh, yes, Wait, I'll share your screen. And so now um, we have about half an hour for questions and answers. And I have a question. Um, this is a question for Malik, I think. Um, and it relates to the point that you made earlier that investments in recycling or waste management infrastructure are not happening. And um, so you mentioned a framework for investing in local infrastructure. Um, could you say some more, what do you mean by this? And um, who's responsible for this? Will this be government, or private sector, or, or both? Um, that's the question uh, from, from Sarah O'Connor. Uh, Sarah Co Carroll from Al MacArthur Foundation. Um, I think the the principle of investment is is quite straightforward in the sense that 
the more competition you have in terms of private companies coming against each other and trying to find the best solution, the outcome for the public sector or, or, or the citizens is, is found to be best. What we find is wherever there is a singularity of delivery, be it from a public or a private company, the, the quality of services may not be the, at the optimal level that they, they could be. And, and much to Joanne's point, we have a lot of incoming questioning from a lot of the, the large uh, FMCG companies saying, how can we you know, help them collect some of these bottles that they're producing or find ways to uh, recover them? And, and at this moment, unless the investment is put in place, and, and there's a lot of places where the governments and the, uh, the municipalities are standing in the way of this investment because they're very worried about their funding or their position within that society. So what we find is if we can separate the public sector role to be one of uh, legislation and enforcement and regulation and the private sector of delivery and, uh, and investment, I think it's, uh, it's a bit simplistic, but it's a bit straightforward in terms of knowing what to do. And then it allows for uh, uh, optimization of the, of the platforms to ensure that we can deliver uh, the needs of the citizens and also some of the larger corporations, such as the ones that uh, Joanne mentioned in her deck, wanting or you know, being told to collect their waste and at this moment not having their ability to put their hand on, on, on these things. I don't know if I answered that question, Patra. Okay, um, also just uh, wanted to remind you, in case you want to talk, if you want to um, speak, if you have a comment, um, you can use the raise hand function um, and then we can unmute your microphone and, and you can either pose your question directly or, or comment on any of the, um, the presentations. Um, so the next question we have, um, I have this as a question for Ashish, um, and uh, this is by Karen Nash, um, who appreciates actually your point about uh, bringing in the social dimension. Um, and the question concerns um, affected people who need a voice in the circular economy conversation. So, but who can provide this voice? Um, is it INGOs, CSOs, industry? Um, and who should be representing the social perspective at the heart of this discussion? Uh, thanks, Karen, for this question. Uh, I think uh, there have been certain initiatives, and of course, there is this global alliance uh, for waste pickers. There is, of course, there are lots of civil society organizations which are operating in different parts of the world. And so of course, in India, I'm sort of very aware of the scenario of the scene. There are several sort of NGOs which work very closely with informal sector workers and waste pickers who are like the well, Chintan, the Swatch Cooperative in Pune, there is Sahas in Bangalore and in, Gur in Gurgaon, there is Hasiro Dola. So there are a bunch of these organizations which are already working on the rights of waste pickers. Uh, I think uh, they, there is a sudden change. There's a certain change in the way the large companies also see the role of the informal sector and also the private companies, large waste management companies who've seen uh, the role of the informal sector as potential allies for delivering cost efficient solutions. So I've been working in this area in India since 2007. And over the last 12 years, 13 years, we've seen a, a remarkable change in how the informal sector is from being perceived as a competitor in provision of waste management services by large private corporations, where, Informal sector is now seen as an ally for delivering cost efficient solutions on the ground. And I think this is part of the advocacy effort of a lot of organizations in the civil society uh, who have been quite active and also an acknowledgement by the government of India, as well as other sort of uh, governments uh, local governments in, in within India, that the informal sector is actually providing an alternative model for enhancing circularity in developing country contexts. And I think this is something which needs to be acknowledged uh, globally. There is not going to be a standard model for circularity emerging in different types of countries and different types of economies. And I think given the fact that there is a certain amount of strength which is already available and a certain amount of skill set which is already available in the informal sector, the voices will have to be sort of amplified by actors at different level, civil society actors at the local level, of course, international organizations which are working locally 
Uh, I think GIZ does that uh, sort of in significant ways within India, but in also in other countries. Also, organizations like Tier Fund and others who've been working on these issues uh, across countries. And I think this is how alliances would build up. Uh, so we need to develop and curate these alliances. I don't think it's going to happen by, by chance. It will have to be curated. And now we have a question for Joanne. Um, this question by um, Jamin Jetwa. And it relates, it's about the responses um, that you received or your engagement with the companies, mm -hmm. um, with those four companies that you highlight in, in your report. Yeah. Um, what have been their comments and, and how, how, do you, how have you engaged with them previously? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we haven't had a chance to speak to them yet about the report, but we've got discussions coming up with all of them. Um, but we have been talking to them for nearly a year now to, well, to three of the companies. So I think we found with uh, Unilever and Nestle um, and, and PepsiCo quite a lot of openness and, and willingness to discuss um, our campaign and what we were asking. And we've obviously seen so in the last year, and this is absolutely not just attributable to Tear Fund because there's been a huge amount of advocacy from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to Greenpeace to, you know, I'm sure parts of the industry as well, um, asking for more ambitious actions to be taken. So what we've seen in the last year is Unilever have made a commitment to reduce their virgin plastic use by half by 2025 and their overall use of plastic by a sixth. So that goes further than, than any other major fast moving consumer company. And they've also committed to collect one for every one they sell, which is also significant because obviously most of their plastic in the global south is sold in sachets, which have no value, which are difficult to collect. So that is a significant commitment. And I think only right that they have stepped up and said that they will do that. Um, and then Nestle, have made quite a different type of commitment where they've much more focusing on investing in developing food grade recycled plastic, which um, is, is not there at the moment. Obviously, they're, they're, although they do sell in sachets, they sell food, whereas Unilever sells a lot of um, domestic uh, sort of household products. And then um, they, they've also sort of said that they will start to collect more in sort of priority countries as well, but their commitment on that hasn't been very clear and public as yet. And then PepsiCo have made a commitment to reduce virgin plastic use by 20% um, by 2025. Um, Coca-Cola were sort of much more reticent to talk to us. Um, however, we are now talking to them and that's been constructive so far. I would say all of the companies you notice there and we were just hearing about the importance of the informal sector. So all of the companies have been really uh, keen to talk to us about how they can improve their work with the informal sector. Um, and as a development, they don't have many agent sort of NGOs who are development NGOs talking to them. Normally it's environmental NGOs who are talking to them. So they're sort of seeing that that's something that we could help them with, but it's not something that we're particularly experts in, but we know people who are um, like we go and others and so we have been developing um, we're hoping to develop a partnership between those four companies um, and um, and waste picker groups um, which is trying to um, agree guiding principles for how companies will implement policies that respect waste picker human rights and improve their income and livelihoods and all, all of the companies are quite keen to be involved in that but that's obviously a huge um, and complex undertaking and something that we're taking sort of quite carefully and slowly because we're aware you've got the most powerful companies in the world and some of the most vulnerable people in the world on the other side and so it's something that we we have to sort of deal with and, and sort of, yeah take slowly and carefully. So the next question I have here on my list is not directed to anyone in particular it's a question by Steve Browning it's about um, should we prioritize most efficient conversion of non-recycled waste to energy? Um, so I might, um, so it mentions also UK uh, gasification mechanisms um, and the potential 
for plastic to offer alternative to coal in China? Um, so these are the question and some ideas. Um, is any one of you uh, happy to answer that? Um, maybe what are your perspectives on, on waste to energy in general, maybe? I will just, I'm not an expert in this area, but um, we, we have looked at this issue a little bit at Tier Fund in the context of the Global South. And I think um, we, we do have a number of concerns um, about waste to energy in the Global South because, um, you know, if, if this is going to be something that's going to be implemented, it requires a very, you know, safely, it requ requires a very high degree of government capacity to implement and to regulate that and to ensure that, um, that emissions that are being made are keeping within what is termed safe guidelines. And we would have you know, major concerns that this is a, a huge outlay for those governments that maybe should be prioritizing things further up the waste hierarchy. Um, and it's something that could cause um, significant health and environmental problems if it's not um, regulated properly, which it's unlikely they would be able to do. Um, so yeah, it's not something that we would be um, supportive of in the context of, of the Global South um, and, and the poorest countries. I'm not an expert on, on the specific technology that the question asked. I think um, I do agree with Joanne that you know, there are better ways of, of dealing with waste. However, in the context that you, know, you look at the, the hierarchy of pollution, you wouldn't want these materials to be lying about a beach or, or sitting around doing nothing. So from where we stand, we find that, you know, we take a very journey based uh, approach and saying, if the right time right now is to recover energy from the material, we'll do it. And whilst we work on changing the, the, the behavior and the desire of the consumer to, to, to push a higher recycling or reduction rate. Yeah, maybe just to add uh, my perspective to this uh, conversation. Uh, I think, uh, well, in, there have been certain experiments with waste to energy in India as well. And the, the experience has actually not been very positive. And it's partly what Joanne already mentioned about the state capacities to regulate and to also look at what kind of outcomes. And so how are the environmental norms being monitored and enforced on the one hand? And I think the fact that these investments are actually for long periods of time. So I think these are not interim solutions. So if there are interim solutions to be found, they might be found elsewhere in sort of activities such as co-incineration, not necessarily setting up standalone waste to energy plants, which are going to last for 30 years or more with significant amount of investments and lock-in and sort of create stranded assets over a period of time. So I think this is something which we should really be very careful about when sort of recommending in the emerging and developing country context. We have another range of questions relating to uh, informality. Um, so, actually, before I go to these, so there's, there's another comment by Steve. Um, and so his question related to unrecyclable and um, unrecyclable waste and not, and he was not talking about simple incineration, which is polluting. So it's clean gasification and post-processing. Um, so maybe that's a discussion with, uh, on this specific technology that we can then also maybe continue afterwards. Um, but thanks, thanks for mentioning this. Um, so going back to the uh, questions on informality, so so there's a question again for Malek, which is um, uh, posed by uh, Shunta Yamaguchi. And the question is, you mentioned that in the informal sector, that the informal sector can be a major force towards the circular economy transition. From your perspective, from the waste management sector, how do you see the opportunities and challenges in working and integrating the informal sector in your formal activities? Speaking as a company that hires thousands of people every year, it's very difficult to get someone to desire to work in the sector. So if someone is already working in that sector, they're halfway there. And so what we found in a lot of cases where we've trained them and given them the relevant PPE, they have been able to be integrated into the, uh, into the process quite uh, straightforward. 
The other thing that we're experimenting with is putting a digital platform underneath the work that they do and finding the ways, uh, you know, uh, where, where they're collecting, how they're collecting, and then if they stop all of a sudden or something happens, we can come and help. The informal sector is not going to go away unless you find them another job, right? So from where we sit, we, we would like to take them in and help them much more than drive them away from this because it's only going to drive a worse behavior. And from where we're sitting, there is a role for them, as Joanne has mentioned. There is a place and, and a skill that they have developed in, in finding these materials and doing the work. And I think to marginalize them and say they have no role whatsoever is, is wrong. But at the same time, it has to be done within a framework of support and to make sure that, I mean, there's a lot of the, the, uh, the informal uh, sector in, in a lot of countries is governed by a less than lawful uh, bunch. And so there has to be some policing that has to be done around that to make sure that, you know, you're not engaging in a criminal or near criminal activity if, if you bring it in. So the police has to be involved or the, the, the law in some way or form has to be involved to make sure that, you know, uh, this is kept above board. But from where we're sitting, the easiest way to do this is to engage them and to find a, a solution. We didn't enter into a given country about three, four years ago because the government was asking us to circumvent the, in, in the informal sector. And, and, you know, they'd been doing the work for 25 years and we didn't agree with it. We thought, you know, putting 2,000 people on the street is not how you enter into a market. So from that perspective, we have a lot of respect for, for the work they do. And, and we're happy to engage them should they wish to be engaged. I think in a lot of cases, they do wish to be engaged. I think they've been misrepresented by, you know, uh, PR or, or bad PR and, and bad media coverage. Okay, so we have a couple of questions for Joanne regarding um, your study and um, some of the methods uh, that you used for the study. Um, so you mentioned the demand for change towards reusable and refillable containers. Um, and so does this relate to those six countries which you mentioned? And um, a second question here, have you looked, have you made any consideration of the LCA aspect of plastics being collected and recycled rather than used for energy generation? Um, so yeah, the, the study that was done, the Savannah Comres survey that Tear Fund commissioned was just in India, um, 2000 adults in India, but we also looked at other surveys that have been done um, in emerging economies. That there's not many surveys that have been done in the poorest countries um, for understandable reasons, uh, but there are surveys that have been done in China, Philippines, um, and other countries that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, they weren't asking obviously the same questions as we were asking, but it was clear from those surveys that people, ordinary people were trying to reduce plastic use and they were very concerned about plastic pollution. So the point that we were trying to make um, with that survey was showing that there is demand and there is concern from consumers across the world, not just in the global north, which is sometimes the picture that can be painted um, by, by some who, who want to sort of continue business as usual. Um, all of this information is obviously in the report, um, which is available at tearfund.org, the burning question. Um, <clears throat> on the question about LCA and what was it again, Patrick, sorry? Um, whether you have done LCA comparing mm. um, the LCA as an aspect of plastics being collected and recycled rather than used for energy generation. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, we haven't done that. Um, we think that there is generally a real lack of LCA analysis in a developing country context, and most of the LCAs that are done are assuming that collection is happening and they don't take into account the fact that a lot of this stuff in the global south is dumped or burnt. Um, and we think it would, that would be a sort of useful area to look at. Um, we also would be, we also think another area of research that would be really important to do would be 
um, looking at the sort of different environmental and other costs of the different interventions like reduction you know if so for example coca-cola at the moment are just investing in collection and they say they want to collect every single bottle and can that they sell um by 2030 um around the world and that is in the context of rising plastic collection and at the moment they're actually off track I mean, meeting that commitment because they are in, partly, I think, because they're increasing their plastic use um, as, as their business grows. So um, I think one of, the, one of the things we'd be really interested in is looking at how does, you know, the amount of sort of infrastructure and investment that they're going to have to make to collect all of that as compared to the types of investment that they're going to have to make if they want to move back to refillable and reusable models you know how do those costs care i think we're pretty clear that like from an environmental perspective and um, particularly refillable plastic is much um would do much better on an lca analysis um than the throwaway plastic um but look at look at the kind of economic costs as well because i think that's a really key sort of piece of information that we're lacking and, and is going to be really important for influencing those people that invest in these companies. Thank you, Thank you Joanne. Um, we have a number of questions left, but only a few minutes. Um, I'd just like to combine uh, a couple of questions which relate to policy and which link also back to the uh, keynote uh, presentation earlier. So a question by Zhao Yuan is, what's your take on the, on the EU circular economy action plan? That's one question. And I'd like to combine this with um, another question by Ward Patterson. Um, should government procurement be used to boost demand for recycled materials? And um, maybe we start with um, Ashish and then Malek and Yodran, and please also feel free to combine any final words or comments that you would like to make. I'll, well, of course, uh, public procurement can actually be a pretty strong driver for uh, enhancing the demand for uh, recyclable products. But I think, uh, again, sort of this has been an ongoing discussion, lots of debates around sort of creating the demand, but what kind of uh, standardization needs to be done at a subnational level and also within sort of, yeah, within the country for uh, in for, for sort of products. I think that's very critical because in the absence of that, very simple decisions like looking at uh, recyclable, sort of recycled, for instance, fly ash bricks, bricks made out of fly ash as compared to regular bricks. I think this is, uh, this can be driven very easily by public procurement and can actually create a huge demand uh, for, uh, for sort of an environmentally friendly product. But uh, if the standardization does not allow that, for public procurement, I think this is going to be a big problem in the long run. As far as the circular economy action plan of the EU is concerned, I think uh, one of the critical issues is about the financing, which is available for the implementation at the subnational level, uh, and also at the sort of uh, how are sort of companies or how are countries going to allocate financial resources for this ambitious plan, and uh, because of course uh, these these. Uh, goals in these action plans have to be translated into implementable actions and also the role what role does international cooperation have or this alliancing building alliance building at the international level have for the implementation of circular economy beyond the, the boundaries of the european union and i think that's something which would be worthwhile to look at from the perspective of a developing economy uh, my final remarks uh, sort of i think uh, uh, coming from a large emerging economy like India, I think there are significant challenges for transitioning to a circular economy uh, at the, the diversity of agendas and diversity of priorities. However, I think the role of international cooperation and the role of research and the role of uh, sort of international organizations is very critical in this entire transition and transformation to a circular economy. And they're very tailor-made advice, very sort of uh, advice, which is actually looking at the critical challenges of, in a country context rather than generic sort of 
prescriptions on why this is a great uh, transformational approach is much more critical. And I think that's why it's very important to provide or sort of engage in dialogue and discussion with the local sort of authorities at different levels, and local policymakers at different levels, as well as other stakeholders like the private sector and civil society. Because what different organizations, multinational organizations say in Europe might actually not be exactly the same and is usually not the same what they would say in India and in other countries. And I think it's very important to have dialogue at different levels uh, in order to sort of, well, accelerate this transformation towards a circular economy. Okay, great. Thank you, Ashish. And then um, Malik, over to you. Um, thank you. Um, I think if we go back to your question of saying, will the government intervention drive a, a higher circularity? I think for sure it, it, it would if, if they really push it in. Because if you look today, at the price of uh, virgin material, at, at you know the oil being closer to twenty dollars uh, than it was when it was closer to sixty or a hundred, uh, there is going to be a large squeeze on the recycling and and the recyclable market. And so the price of virgin material, you know, has to compete. Uh, sorry, the price of, of recycled material has to compete at some level, and market forces alone will not drive that. So you need some form of legislation and and requirement by government and by regulation to make sure that you have that. Having said that, one of the questions on, on, on by, the, by the participant uh, has, was, you know, what is the importance of waste characterization? And I think that's where it all ends and it all begins. You know, we operate uh, 365, 24 seven across the world. And the waste in, in July has nothing to do with the waste in January so in, in, in most places. And I think, you know, the, the fact that, you know, I see Ashish, you know, there is the monsoon season in India. It, it, it makes a completely different waste mix for the for the incinerator in Okla or the incinerator in Jabalpur uh, uh, combined to uh, the, the, the burning cycle. So from that perspective, what we find is the only thing that we, we manage quite hawkishly is the waste characterization because that drives the solution towards circularity. And I think when you look at the other question from, I think, the EIB gentleman, Arnold, um, the, the role of the consumer here is absolute. If the consumer doesn't drive the desire to recycle, the desire to use more sustainable material, uh, you know, everything that goes back and forth will just end up being hooey, right? And I think what we need to make sure is that we are educating the consumer to a reasonable level of competence so that they can make the right decision without being swayed by, you know, campaigns one way or the other. So, you know, to end my sort of, uh, on, a, on a closing note, there is no magic bullet. There is no, you know, one solution fits all. Waste characterization, collect the waste properly, make sure that you understand where and who is doing it very, very safely, and make sure you invest and enforce. Thank you very much. Yeah, I don't have a great deal to add to that, particularly, um, you know, the EU Circular Economy Action Plan is something that we haven't looked at closely. I mean, we understand that civil society sort of working in plastics in the EU um, are sort of fairly positive towards it and have been fairly positive in responding to it. But obviously, it's a non-binding um, uh, package. Um, and as, as was mentioned earlier, something that um, it's going to be about, you know, what resources what finances what structures there are to implement it um, and the devil will sort of be in the detail i guess one of the things that we as tfon would be concerned about is what are the implications for the global south for the poorest people um yeah i think it's you know it's obviously we've i've been talking mainly about companies and making sure that company practices and are, are inclusive but the same applies to governments as well um, that goes without saying and if you just think about the issue of e-waste, um, which is something that we've looked a little bit at, and how the sort of rules that are made within the EU um, around e-waste could actually have a really significant impact on uh, the global south, where a lot of the e-waste is exported to and taken apart in very dangerous conditions. So rules and regulations that are made in the EU around how um, how that um, the original products are designed and um, whether they are modular and, and, and whether the information is publicly available on how to take them apart safely could make a huge difference to the lives of people 
um, many in West Africa who take apart these, um, you know, EU um, products um, in very dangerous conditions and with huge um, health impacts and environmental impacts. So I think it's always with each policy that's implemented is, is considering like what is the potential harm that could be done here and, and conversely what benefit could we bring through changing this policy through circularity to making sure it's inclusive because making something circular doesn't necessarily make it inclusive and, and we've got to make sure that we've got you know people who obviously bring and understand um, and as well as the people themselves that perspective into these debates. And with this we've um, reached the end of our session. Um, thank you to uh, to you all, uh, Ashish, Malek, and Joanne for your presentations and to all the participants for your questions. Um, and apologize for um, running a bit over uh, over time, um, but it was, I think, important to, to answer those final questions. And uh, with this, um, we close for now. We'll be back at one o'clock um, in about an hour. And um, the next theme or the next theme links to the questions of investments and circular economy and finance. We have um, a range of um, experts from the finance sector to talk about um, uh, finance and circular economy. So um, yes, yeah, please join us again at one and enjoy your break, whether it's a lunch break or, or dinner break, depending on where you are. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, see you shortly. <laughs>